The motion picture you're about to see is the first of its kind ever attempted because it's about unusual men and women, people, fishing people. If you've ever seen a film about fishing, you know fishing is not a visual sport normally. Why? Because people's thoughts cannot be filmed. The surging drama of two worlds connected by a slender line, two hearts locked in deadly combat, cannot be recorded. So the world you're about to enter has never been placed in a serious book about angling. These are the thrill seekers. Theirs is the adventure world of oddity angling. But pay close attention, because each technique, while odd, is a bona fide way of taking fish where and when it happened. Our film stories are for your entertainment, but the fishermen are completely serious. To them, fishing is far more than a pastime. It represents high adventure, action, and thrills. Some may even ask, why bother? Why not stick to time-honored fishing techniques? To these, we must honestly answer, fishing can be an adventure in a world where adventure has become a spectator sport. The photographers who took the film belong to this group of adventure seekers. The sequences you will see were taken over a period of years, treasured possessions of the men who gathered them. They're experts, both in the fields of photography and fishing motion pictures. They are fishermen themselves, and the film they have gathered represents some of the most unusual and difficult filming they have done. So come along with us, and we'll show you how this film was made. What's more, we'll let the men who filmed the sequences tell about them, how and why they happened. But as you enter this new concept of fishing adventure, be prepared. Your sensations could be a passport into this action world where men and women live to catch a thrill. Screening room A. It's right down this hallway, the first door on the right. Thank you. You're welcome. Jack! Ramon! Good to see you. Welcome to Atlanta. Hey, fellas, hold it down a minute. I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is Senor Ramon Urea of the Cinema International de America del Sur. He works out of Bogota, Colombia. I don't know if you know these men, Ramon. This is Gil Carter here with Canadian Film Industries nice Limited. You, Gil. This is Harold Wells Jr. of Harold Wells Pictures Hello, in Ramon. Minneapolis. My pleasure. Well, it looks like we're all here, so I think we might as well get started. Ramon, why don't you take your film up to Charlie? Say, uh, Charlie, you want to take uh, Ramon's film? The rest of the footage is up there already. Ramon, why don't you come in and sit down? 
Well, uh, this is uh, the first time that uh, we've had a chance to really get together and discuss this thing. So what I'd like to do is make sure that we're all aiming for the same thing. Right. Agreed. For years, we've all been making fishing films for various clients, right? And we've all run into some pretty weird stories out there. From what I've been able to gather, we've all collected film of these unusual fishing sequences. So guys, the idea is to pool our footage into a single motion picture about the odd stuff that we found. Agreed? Gee, right. Right, right. Okay, now, as uh, far as restrictions go, there are a couple of things we gotta do. We gotta be frank about where, including maps, and how the film was taken. And I'm sure we all want each other's assurance that as far as you know, this footage has never been seen by a national audience. Okay? All right. All right. Okay, I guess we're ready. Let me check with Charlie. Hey, Charlie! Uh, what film do you have strung up uh, back there? I have the Midwestern sequences on, Mr. Pennington. Right. Well, Harold, looks like you're on deck. Why don't you move over to the console over there and narrate for us and roll your film anytime you're ready. Okay, thanks, Jack. Well, I know this stuff is strange. I took it, and I don't believe some of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I know you guys are going to have to go some to beat this. Okay, roll the film, Charlie. Two years ago, we were on location in Minnesota's Masabi Iron Range. Mm, middle of April it was. Well, one day, our set director told me all our extras were turning up missing. What were you paying them, by the day? No, it wasn't anything like that. Fact is, the whole town was heading for Duluth on Lake Superior. Seems the annual smelt spawning run was on. Boy, you should have seen all the people. Now, this is just a sampling. I mean, there were whole cities of campers and trailers and tents, too. The best part of the state must have been there. Men, women, kids by the carload. Most of the action comes at night when the fish crowd into the rivers to lay their eggs. People pour into the water. Oh, what a racket. But you can't scare those fish. Water's so cold, your hand will turn numb in 30 seconds. Some of the smelters take on a pretty good supply of antifreeze, though. You know the smelt is a saltwater fish that spawns in fresh water. Some fellow stocked a few in a Michigan lake in 1912. They escaped. Well, you can see what happened. Lake trout eat a lot of smelt all year long, but the fishermen take them only for, oh, about a week. Dipping is the usual way of catching them. The fish swim upstream, you dip downstream. You know, sometimes the gals make better smelters than the men do. Cold doesn't seem to bother them. They're more tenacious, too. When the fish start to run, some smelters get so excited, they throw half the fish they catch back in the water. Well, you got a few in, anyway. But down near town, there's a kind of a sheltered bay. They use long two-man nets there. Hey, look at that gal in the background, would you? Pulling the seine with bare arms. The smelt run along the shore here looking for a stream to spawn in. They weren't running too well when I was there. Well, still, they weren't doing what you'd call bad either. The idea is to, you know, just keep at it. Sooner or later, you're gonna fill a tub. But while we were there, the lake shore was the hot spot. If it's that cold, why do they do it? I don't know. It's a season opener, of course, but it's a happening. Like a rock festival, only everyone takes part instead of watching. Some of these guys never do seem to settle down enough to get all the smelt into a holding bag. Don't fill that too full, you gotta carry it. Some people say the best part of smelting is eating. Others don't agree. And just so there's a choice, they set up a big circus tent in town so you can buy smelt already cooked. But really, just being there is what it's all about. Kids really make good fishermen. I guess maybe because they have more time in the summer to spend at it. But they're kind of low on patience, so they're always coming up with a new wrinkle on how to produce easier and quicker with less work. Now, these three came up with a trick they call balloon fishing. 
The technique they're using isn't a better way to catch balloons. No, sir. <laughs> it's a takeoff on an old meat hunter trick used back in India times. Now, the first order of business is to take a fish from a feeding school. Now, for the serious part. An underinflated toy balloon is tied onto a piece of monofilament, and this is pinned to the dorsal fin. And then the whole outfit is tossed back in the water. Being crafty, the kids know the fish will take off after the school, dragging the telltale balloon behind. When the balloon stops, the school's feeding. So, in go the worms. Of course, old trappers and Indians used air bladders from larger fish. But serious fishermen have come a long way since then. If you're crafty enough to use a balloon, <laughs> you're certainly smart enough to bring your older brother along to take the fish off the hook. I hate to say it, but while the kids' method does work, and they keep mom and dad and sonnies all summer, unfortunately, there's no way to guarantee size. Go get them, Tiger. School's moving. Older brothers are awful handy, too, when it comes to putting a worm back on the hook, even if you do know how. <laughs> hey, Harold, you think this would work on walleye? Oh, I think it'd work on any school fish. Hey, look at this. Technique is one thing, but this is too much. The worm is bigger than that fish. Back you go to mommy. And before you leave, don't forget to bring the tattletale fish back on board. Otherwise, you'd end up with balloons sailing all over the lake. But there's always time for one more. Boating these big ones can be tough. But perseverance pays off, and to the victor go the spoils. Hey, Ramon, I bet you never saw anything like this in South America. When winter comes, we don't hibernate. If anything, more of our people fish in winter than summer. Over, oh, 300,000 years, we can tell. Why? It's all that cold. Well, up here, if you want to fish in winter, it almost has to be through the ice. We're also turning out today main door prizes. What these two contestants lack in technique they make up for in real zest. A $30 prize, and another $20 gets a ticket. On the door prize. Yeah, I have them back home. Yeah, I'm going to go to the store. Yeah, it's fishing too. Oh, what a time to lose a big one. All right, eight and a half pound order. Only half a minute left. And eight and a half That fish must have been starving to death as it swam over to the fisherman's second hole and hit the bait there. Might even beat that eight and a half pounder. Hey, That's all we need. They were going to log Let's get fishing out there and see if we can't catch a few. Here comes someone with a northern right now. That's a dandy. Must be about 10 pounds. Awful small fisherman for such a big fish. Look at there. Take it right up to the weighing scale. Let's whale it out. Let me know what the weight of that one is, will you please? That's 14 pounds even, a northern pike queen, 14 But this is winter carnival, you know, snow queens and stuff like that. The more adventurous ice fishermen head for the wilderness on snow sleds. Getting to some of these far northern lakes is almost impossible in winter. The engines get them there, and the engines take the work out of augering holes in that three-foot ice.
How's he gonna catch a fish out of that fucking hole you drill? But here's a surprise even these hotshot ice tappers don't realize. This burbot or eel pout will be tossed aside. Thousands are every year. Most anglers consider them trash fish. They sure look like it, but boy, they are delicious eating. Better, some say, than the highly touted lake trout. You can see where a guy'd really get a kick out of pulling one of these in. But come to think of it, it looked pretty silly holding up an eel pout for a picture. It's kind of hard to think of Pier, South Dakota as a hot fishing spot. I sure didn't, especially in winter. The fact is, though, fishing's good year-round. Cutting a 300-pound block of ice for a spearing hole used to be one heck of a lot of work, but the chainsaw has changed all that. South Dakotans are real partial to spear fishing. During a good winter, these Missouri River backwaters below Oahe Dam will have little cities of dark houses. And they're dark inside. That's so the fish can't see the fishermen. Now, this is kind of a sneaky way of going about it. Spear fishermen use a lure, no hooks on it. And when you jig it slowly up and down, it flies in a circle and attracts the fish. The pike figure it's an easy meal, move in for the big kill and get zapped. You know, this is one of the most vicious of all the game fish. In fact, when they get this big, they almost look like they live up to their nickname, freshwater barracuda. The fish are so hungry, even a handful of buttons makes a perfectly good attractor for the fish. Indians used to drop corn through the hole so the dark fish would show up against the light grain. A lot of people think of sparing as cruel. Well, maybe it is, but more importantly, it also takes quite a toll of breeder-sized fish. So the conservation department keeps a close watch on the sport. Since this was filmed, more and more spawning areas have been designated off-limits to spearing. When spring came, I was working on a film in Redding, California, and ran into a well-known but seldom-fished oddity. Now, probably every fisherman in the United States has heard about sturgeon fishing, but darn few have ever caught one. Ed Glaze, an old friend of mine, promised he could show us in a few days more sturgeon, real bragging-sized ones, than most fishermen see in a lifetime. Well, it sounded like a terrific opportunity. So with another fishing buddy from Red Wing, Minnesota, Ole Jensen and his son David, we set out to learn about the fabled white sturgeon of Northern California. Right away, Ed made us swear on a pile of trout and catfish heads never to reveal the secret sturgeon holes he was going to show us. We sealed the bargain with a big bite of sturgeon caviar. Ole and I didn't think it was so bad, but <laughs> David probably would have preferred a hamburger. Well, apparently Ed didn't have much faith in our sacred vow or the power of catfish heads. He blindfolded us so we couldn't see where we were headed. It sure was hard to keep from taking a peek to see where we were going. But when we finally stopped, I didn't have the slightest idea where we were. Wish I did, though. Most spectacular piece of high desert I ever saw. One thing we did notice right away is we slid 200 feet down to the river. 97 degrees in the shade, and there wasn't any shade. Oh, that water sure looked cool and inviting. Really big sturgeon are sluggish creatures. They lie in deep holes at the foot of rapids, waiting until the mood hits them to move on. So locating one of these secret holes is like finding the pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. Uh-oh, a slash and strike. In many cases, these fish weigh more than the fishermen. So when old Whisker Nose wants some line, he pretty much takes it with a simple flip of that low gear tail. David could tell right away this is going to be one long battle. That fish doesn't even have the courtesy to head downstream. It drags Ole upstream where the footing's even rougher. 
To make it worse, Ole knows the sturgeon is putting up his end of the fight in that cool water, while the fisherman feels like an overripe raisin. Then the ultimate insult. The sturgeon surfaces and flips Ole the bird with a lobe of his huge tail. Well, sir, that makes Ole real. That fish not only has no respect, he's downright indelicate. David hollered out, horse him, Dad. You got him coming to you. And Ole horsed. Well, about as good as you can with a fish that's obviously got a mind of its own. Ole was tired, sure. But it was obvious the big fish was tiring, too. If Ole could only keep from melting into a wet spot on a hot rock, he'd get his trophy sure. See, to be legal, the sturgeon must pick up the bait like it would its natural food, by mouth. There's only one in a thousand anglers who get a legal sturgeon this far. These prehistoric fish are slow growers. This one could be 30 years old. They get there, though. White sturgeon have been known to weigh more than 1,900 pounds. They're valuable, too. Besides caviar and meat, the air bladder is a source of icing glass. It's used as a filter in brewing beer and fine wines. Figuring on David's six foot two inch height, this sturgeon measures just over six feet and weighs a whopping 105 pounds. You can see the ancient lineage of the sturgeon, spinal cord extending into the upper lobe of the tail and the body covered with these bony plates for protection. But even the armor plating isn't complete protection from the ordeals of an 80 or 90 mile upriver trip. A lot of them die from the beating they take. Strangely enough, the sturgeon is well adapted for river travel, even though it spends most of its life in the open sea. Just ahead of its unusual mouth are four rubbery whiskers used in locating food in sentiment-laden rivers. Once found, the food is sucked up through the unusual protruding mouth in a vacuum cleaner-like action. Finally, I'd learned what those bandanas were really for. Not to hide the secret honey hole of sturgeon, but to wipe the fevered brows of well-worked fishermen. Well, the very next summer, I went back to Oahe Dam and ran into some of the tallest fish and tails in the whole Midwest. Now, I want to see if you guys can top this one. When I got up to the dam, fishermen with heavy saltwater tackle were going through the wildest ritual I ever saw, like some cabalistic rite dance to the music of the modern beat. Jerkin' and tugging actually resulted in a strike or something. For a while, it looked like he caught a big chunk of bottom or maybe a baby truck. Well, it was a fish, all right. The thing looked more like a nightmare crossed between a duck-billed platypus and a pollywog from a one-ton frog. Well, as it turned out, the fish is a prehistoric critter called a paddlefish. You see, they're caught by snagging. Bare hooks, no bait. You see, these paddlefish are zooplankton feeders. Don't eat anything bigger than a trout's eyelash. So they have to be snagged with big treble hooks jerked through the water. Saltwater rigs are important, too. Because a big bill can run up to 180 pounds. There must be an awful lot of them if you can snag them with bare hooks. Oh, you bet there are. They come up from the Mississippi and then get stopped with the big dams. They're in there by the thousands. Are they any good to eat? Oh, I should say about 50 pounds of clean white meat from a 90-pound fish. These fishermen use an alligator gaff for bank fishing. You just set the metal jaws on that gaff. 
When they reach down and hit the fish with a trigger, the jaws snap shut and the fight's just about over. Paddlefish make two runs every year, midsummer and midwinter. Since I was there at the beginning of the run, I took a trip down the river where the fishermen use the snag and tackle from a boat when the fish are surfacing. 20 to 40 pound test lines are favored. Five or six ounces of lead keep the line on the bottom. To hold the fish, 7-0 or 8-0 hooks are needed. And they're usually rigged according to the individual likes of the angler. You know, these billfish are pretty strange critters. Nearest relatives are in the Yangtze River of China. Now, those fellas get up to 12 feet long. Over here, they don't get much bigger than six feet. Got a lot of names, too. Spoonbill cat, billfish, shovel nose cat, and spoonbill sturgeon. Well, really, the last name is the most accurate. They don't look much like it, but their nearest relatives are sturgeons. In fact, the paddlefish eggs make pretty good caviar. It's a big fish, too. Up here in South Dakota, the record was caught right below Oahe Dam. It was over five feet long and weighed 110 pounds. Nobody pays too much attention to these fish. They could disappear forever. The big dams are cutting off their spawning runs and commercial fishing accounts for a lot. Paddlefish get caught in the nets. That's too bad. Mighty interesting fish. Like I said, billfish eat zooplankton. They swim with a mouth open. Microscopic animals are scooped up and then strained out of the water with these built-in combs. Now, here's how they clean them. You guys pay close attention because the method is unique to paddlefish. First, the spinal cord's got to come out. So a cut's made around the tail. The cord's about twice the length of the fish and is full of a stinky kind of fluid. Now that spinal fluid can ruin all the meat, so make sure you get this cord out intact before proceeding. The thing isn't very pretty, but it was because of this rope-like cord that people thought they weren't any good to eat. And then you gotta cut away the red meat on the sides and the top and the bottom. In the center is the good white meat that tastes kind of like, well, oysters to some. If you guys think you've got anything stranger than paddle fishing, I'd like to see it. Well, at least that's one fish that won't get caught up the creek without a paddle. Oh, oh that's, that's bad. I can't dig it. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thanks, Harold. I never knew there was such a thing as a paddle fish. I've been just talking to Ramon, and he says there's enough weird fishing and fish in South America to make a whole movie by itself. Hey, Charlie, string up Mr. Urea's uh, footage, will you? Okay, Ramon, we're gonna give you a chance to prove that. As you know, my studio is in Bogota, Colombia. A lot of money has been invested recently with us to interest fishermen in South American fishing. People think of South America as lying due south of the United States. <laughs> it is south to be sure, but most of it lies east of North America. Still, the best fishing is just an hour or so from the United States by jet. In fact, Guayaquil, Ecuador, on the westernmost point of South America, is just a short flight due south of Miami, Florida. When the United States was still an infant nation, Guayaquil, under a powerful Spanish governor, enjoyed prosperity as a major seacoast town and gateway to the mighty Pacific Ocean. But through the years, it has slid into international backwaters, browsing in a fierce equatorial sun. For the most part, tourists ignore Guayaquil's lushness, and the surrounding desert holds little interest for them. Native Ecuadorians eke out a meager living, but they are happy people with great pride. Their towns, while very poor, are very clean. Their homes are built on stilts, so their animals can find shelter from the sun. In all, a happy place, but of no interest to tourists. So it might seem a little strange at first to find on the westernmost point of the continent a well-staffed luxury hotel offering visitors all the advantages of tourist life in the most glamorous resort spas of South America. But there is a reason for a hotel such as Carnero Inn, a reason that draws people from almost every corner of the world to this cliff high above the Pacific. Billfish, real ones, Harold, millions of them. The reason they are here is logical. Marlin and Sale traveling up the coast must converge to pass the bulge of South America. 
There they congregate by the millions. The Humboldt Current keeps them there by supplying bait fish as food. Only recently has this been discovered. So since the marlin is here to eat bait fish, the fishermen are only too willing to oblige them. Fresh bait is one of the secrets these Ecuadorian skippers use. Championship fishermen like Mr. and Mrs. Bill Leak of Florida are quick to admit these are the best marlin waters in the world. Ikuru shouts the mate. What a thrill. A long nose is inspecting the bait. Its fins light up like one of your neon signs. Everyone holds their breath. Strike! The fishes hit the bait. Ladies first. But what is this? The bait robber of the Humboldt. At the last moment, a dolphin or dorado dashes in and steals the bait from the open mouth of a huge marlin. But the boys don't mind. All dorado caught belong to them. Later on shore, the delicious fish will be sold to help pay a bonus to the crew. The fish used to be called the dolphin, but confusion arose because of the animal by the same name, bottlenose dolphin or porpoise. So fishermen are calling it by the Spanish name, dorado. Missing a big one isn't a great loss. Here's a little trick. The reel is set on free spool. A fragile toothpick keeps it from running out. But a strike will break it, releasing the line. There's one. Another marlin moves in for dinner. This is vital. Bill must fool the marlin into thinking it has killed the bait. Watch the lines. We try. thinks the fish may be tiring by now. But it isn't tiring. It is very mad and dives under the boat to cut the line. But the marlin misses the propeller and the line holds. If they can only gaff him before he has another chance to cut the line. And dive for the prop. Stop the motor! Will it hold? is pretty happy about this catch. Bill because he has a 250 pound trophy to enter in the Carnero Billfish Derby. The boys because they'll be able to sell the marlin for food. Marlin is considered a delicacy in Ecuador. These men take great pride in bringing fish and fishermen together. But for the remora or sucker fish, it's a parting of the ways. You'll have to look for another ride. Some wives appreciate their husband's catch, but this is too much. Or is it? All of a sudden, Bill spots another boat. But it doesn't seem to be fishing. These fishermen are about to unleash their own secret weapon. They have come up with a new version of an old technique to help them pick the marlin they want, rather than taking whatever hits the lure. Ted and his wife, Dorothy, have perfected an old outrigger substitute called kite fishing. Two rods are used. Ted's goes directly to the kite. Dorothy's line runs through a ring on the kite's line and then down to the bait in the water. When a billfish is spotted, the boat moves as close as possible. Then by either letting the kite out or pulling it in, 
the bait can be moved so it passes right under the pointy nose of the fish. The natural motion of boat and kite give the bait a skipping action like a frightened bait fish, but smoother than an outrigger. Then there's nothing to do but wait. But in these waters, it shouldn't be long. There, a marlin, near the bait, off to the right. Now move the bait till it's under his bill and hold your breath. When the fish strikes the bait, two halves of this magnet separate. He's on. Now, I suppose you're going to tell us using the kite to catch a marlin is the biggest fish story so far. Maybe not the biggest, but surely the tallest. But meanwhile, Bill and Jane Leake have troubles of their own. Porpoises have invaded the marlin grounds. These playful animals can be rough even on big fish. The marlin will depart for quieter water. The porpoises are heading west and will soon be gone. The marlin will return. But if we follow these ocean greyhounds for 600 miles, we will see the most unusual islands in the world, the Galapagos. The most famous residents are the giant land-dwelling tortoises, loved by children all over the world. In danger of extinction, these magnificent creatures are now protected by international law and attempts to raise them are being made at the Charles Darwin Research Station. Some success has already been made and hatchlings will soon be returned to the island of their parents' birth. Besides the tortoises, the Galapagos have other strange animals and sights, like this unique marine iguana, or the love dance of a pair of cow-nosed rays. Below the ocean surface, millions of fish make the islands their homes. Many feel this is the world's largest fish hatchery. Local Ecuadorians take advantage of a new tourist trade by lobster fishing, the hard way. In a day, they can fill a boat, but they use no nets or traps. Just masks, fins, and a pair of cotton work gloves to protect their hands from the razor-sharp edges of the Lagusta's shell. The Langusta is a true spiny lobster, often sold as lobster cakes. They have no claws, as do your main lobster, which is more closely related to the freshwater crayfish, or crawdad, as I understand you call them. You must be a powerful swimmer and quick as a cat. Perhaps it is best these divers use nothing but their hands. But if tourist pressure increases, who knows? It would not be difficult to clean out the lobster using modern methods. But while the Galapagos hold many tall fishing tails, a radio message from my cousin Alvaro hints at even more unusual fishing deep in the headwaters of the Amazon River. We pack up our underwater gear and fly from Ecuador on to Bogota, where Alvaro and an American friend are awaiting me. From Bogota, we head toward the land of El Dorado, famous king of Colombian legend who centuries ago hid his golden treasure from the Spanish in a jungle lake, and thus turned many of the fish in it golden as well. It is fabled the vast treasure still lies hidden beneath the mysterious waters. We cross the Andes and below see the last traces of civilization before 
Llanos, the vast land sea jungle stretching 3,000 miles to the Atlantic, containing one third of all the fresh water on Earth, an unexplored land of mystery. Air travel is limited, so we switch to outboard power on El Rio Valpes. On rivers which feed the mighty Amazon, outsiders are a rare sight in a land where rare sights are common. Like a pile of wash that takes to the air as a swarm of butterflies. These insects love the taste of jabón or soap and cover anything washed in a colorful blanket. But we are here to fish lakes bordering the river. They are deep and clear, yet the water is black. Natives tell strange tales of the lakes and fish here only with reluctance. The first cast goes a long way toward proving the legend of the famous Golden King. After a fierce battle, living proof, El Tucunare, the magnificent golden bass reported by the ancient legend. A golden game fish second to no other in the world, no matter what the color. These big-shouldered fighters can weigh over 30 pounds especially the males, which have an enlarged bump on the top of the head. The lake is so full of fish, scarcely a minute passes before John gets a savage strike. These fish have powerful jaws. They'll throw the lure if you don't set the hooks swiftly. With a flip of its tail, the fish vanishes. John is pretty disgusted with his performance on this fish. But my cousin soon shows him where the truly big tucanare hide themselves. Trouble is, the old master gets one on in no time at all. This looks like a good-sized one, but strangely not as fierce a fighter as the first one. The reason for this is quite apparent as Danielle shows the fish to John. This is an eight-pound female. Nature has given her a spot on the tail to look like an eye to other fish. And of course, the small bump is a giveaway. Danielle, our guide, tells of natives using unusual methods. When the jungle floods, they can fish under monkey-filled trees. We wanted to see this strange sight and set off to find a native fisherman. It takes two days of fishing before we find one. Only the bravest come here since it is fabled that the king, El Dorado, opened the lakes to the Valpes River and allowed the much-feared black piranha to enter and protect his golden treasure. Ordinarily, the natives use a method you North Americans call splattering. They splash a lure noisily back and forth on the water. Their usual hunting weapon is the deadly blowgun. But I saw a bow and arrow in the bottom of his dugout. I wonder if he can hit anything, I thought, as he pulled alongside. He said he wasn't much of a shot with the bow. But while Danielle was fooling with his fishing gear, we managed to talk him into shooting a fish for the camera. Problem was, the dead fish we used sank like a stone. Plus, I don't think he could have hit it anyway. But by the third try, everyone was helpless but laughing. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you need here is a little of my balloon technique. <laughs> but on the inside of the fish. I told Alvaro to throw it closer. Well, why didn't you just have Alvaro toss it in the bottom of the canoe? I wasn't even sure he could have hit that. <laughs> he was happy enough to get the fish, though. If he had to depend on that bow, he'd sure starve to death. The next day, we decide to explore further into the clear black lake, searching for the giant golden bass. John Gray is determined he will be the one to break the record. And for a moment, it looks as though he has. But it is only a snag. Lures are very difficult to get here. And before John's shocked eyes, Danielle jumps overboard and dives for the lure. This can only be the rankest foolishness, thinks John. 
for they say the piranha here are huge. But we have seen no man-eating fish. And after all, Daniel doesn't seem to be afraid. Perhaps he knows something we do not. Perhaps he knows there are no piranha in this part of the lake. But only a few moments later, even farther into the dark waters, Alvaro gets a strike. The fish fights near the surface, quick slashing drives, almost faster than the fishermen can react. Daniel's face lights up. Has he seen something our unpracticed eyes have not? He certainly does not grab the fish as he did with El Tuconare. And for a very good reason, it is the deadly and feared black piranha, largest and most vicious of the dozen or so manatee fish which inhabit most of the rivers of tropical South America. Very little is known about this savage fish. What causes them to attack by the thousands? Why are some parts of a river safe and others scarcely 100 yards away a death trap? Ooh! Ho -ho. <laughs> Each upper tooth matches perfectly a pair of lower teeth, giving a shearing action to the jaws that can sever bone and muscle very easily. That's a big, mean fish. I always thought they were smaller. That thing must weigh over five pounds. Five and a half, actually. Ramon, the truth now. You shot those underwater pictures in a tank, right? I'm just going to show you that. We wait till someone gets a strike. As soon as we are sure it is a piranha, you can tell by the way it fights. I send my assistant cameraman in to film the fish. Assistant? See, it is not dignified for a producer to do this kind of thing. You mean it's not dignified to be eaten alive? See, that is also true. But I thought they'd attack anything that moves in the water. No, just if it moves and leaks a little blood. Say, Ramon, what kind of lures do they use? You must choose plugs with care. The flashing teeth can snap a balsa lure in two and hollow-bodied plastic plugs sink like lead after only one strike. Notice John is only too happy to have Daniel remove the hook from the piranha's mouth. Smart guy. So it seems when the fabled Golden King opened these lakes to the tasty but savage fish of Rio Valpes, he started a chain of events even he could not imagine. Here, deep in the South American jungle, a lodge where sportsmen can quest for exotic tropical fish, till now seen only in aquariums. A place natives call El Dorado. Ramon, that was some wild stuff. I never realized they didn't attack all the time. Oh, just now and then. Oh, boy, hey, what do you say we get a little contrast here, huh? Gil, how about showing us what you brought us from the frozen north? Hey, uh, wait a minute, Jack. Now, that's really not fair. Besides, I've probably got the biggest fishing story of all. How's that? Well, it all started when I got an assignment from the Canadian Conservation Department. From Winnipeg, I traveled north to first Edmonton, then on to Yellowknife. That's the jumping off spot for Victoria Island and Albert Edward Bay. The northern end of this island is less than 200 miles from the magnetic North Pole. Ice chokes the harbors most of the summer. This is the land of the midnight sun, of sunlit nights, of the muskox, seal, the polar bear. Yet even this far north, fishermen can find lodging in a camp that's built and maintained for just one reason, the fabled Arctic char. Aside from its Canadian operators, the camp is run by Eskimos. They find guiding a good source of income when they can't hunt. Every spring, the Eskimos build a camp nearby. The wives, kids, and dogs, a whole bunch, settle down for the summer. The char is a sea fish. It returns to these wild northern lakes to spawn. 
It's a silver fish, but spawners gradually turn blood red during their two-week run. Char fight among themselves, and flashing spoons to make them mad seem to be the best bait. And guys who catch this magnificent creature consider it a rare privilege. So fishermen usually don't waste too much time after arriving. Bud Stiles is fortunate. He works for the Northwest Territories government and spot checks northern camps to make sure they maintain a high degree of excellence. Little is known about the habits of the char. Canada has undertaken extensive studies to determine how much pressure this slow-growing but desirable sporting fish can stand during the short July and August season. The char isn't a spectacular fighter like his more familiar brothers, the Dolly Varden, the Lake Trout, Eastern Brook, or Speckled Trout. Now, a fish like this one will average, oh, from 25 to 35 years old. But even this fine specimen is not at full color. This is sort of the in-between pink stage, so it's returned unharmed. Bud will take another try. Bud claims this is a special lure designed to catch only char in blood red dress. Some fishermen have taken char on flies, streamers mostly, but that's kind of rare. Trolling is the normally accepted method. In general, for most fishermen, char fishing is very much like trophy hunting. Bag limits should take a back seat. Conservation-minded sportsmen look only for that big, truly red trophy fish. Of course, there are always an unsporting few who will stamp their feet and pout if they can't load up a boat with these rare, slow-growing beauties. Now, actually, it doesn't happen quite this fast. I've compressed five hard days of fishing and many released char into these few scenes. But Bud has his trophy, a 13 and a half pound spawning male char in formal red dress, a once in a lifetime catch with an audience of one. But really, who needs an audience at a time like this? Now, so far, we've mentioned only the Arctic char. But another trophy fish shares these cold northern waters, the sea run trout. After five days of boat fishing, Bud feels he's earned a little rest. Casting is supposed to be the break, but on his very first cast, the bottom rises up, takes his spoon. Again, the fight is not spectacular simply like trying to slow down a 747 on takeoff. And that 10-pound test line doesn't speed the job up any. Nearly half an hour passes before the huge trout nears shore. This fish is just in from the sea on its spawning run when Bud tags onto it. It's fat, full of life. And it takes an experienced angler to bring one like this to shore. Strange as it may seem, these trout are not relished by the Eskimos. Instead, they prefer char to eat, reserving the lake trout as a gourmet meal for another cherished member of the family, the sled dogs. And the usual mob of kids meet Bud at the landing. They're all pretty anxious to lend a hand. One of them is the son of David, the head guide. And Bud decides that trout would make a great present. So that evening, about 11 o'clock, as the sun slips below the horizon for an hour or so, there's a very special event, a bonfire. You see, in a land where there are no trees for 450 miles, a scrap wood fire is a real luxury. So Bud decides this is the opportune time to make the presentation. After all, a 22-pound trout is nothing to sneeze at, even up here. However, Bud's in for a little surprise. White man fish with pole, Eskimo fish with harpoon. To find out more about Eskimo whaling, I took the film crew from Victoria Island to Churchill, Manitoba. That's the heart of the whaling industry. 
Now, beluga whaling at the mouth of the Churchill River on Hudson Bay is the center of a fierce controversy. Only those of native Indian or Eskimo blood can take part, although a few licenses are sold annually to sportsmen. Old Fort Prince of Wales guards the harbor mouth through which the snow white whales have to pass. In the inner harbor, whalers like the Hicks brothers ply their trade. They're proud of their Scotch Eskimo ancestry and of their equipment. Homemade harpoons, chunks of iron with razor sharp detachable heads tied to bright steel floats. Whaling as practiced by the Hicks combines sport with the deadly business of earning a living. Anytime a herd is spotted entering the harbor on an incoming tide, they're ready to move out. The whales are spotted at close range and the chase is on. The boats these whalers use are very specialized. They're 18 feet long, modeled after freighter canoes and powered by 35 horsepower motors. The men must rely on teamwork. The harpooner can see the whale as it veers wildly underwater. The tip of the harpoon follows the whale's every move and the helmsman follows the tip of the harpoon. They have to drive the whale into shallow water and then the thrust. Even with the harpoon home and the telltale barrel following behind, it takes quite a while to bring the 1,500 pound whale into gun range. Canadian law dictates the animal must be dispatched with a shot from a 303 Enfield quickly and humanely. Another large herd is spotted. Other boats join the chase. This is tough work for experts like the Hicks, but for visiting sportsmen who can buy a license for the right to kill a whale, the chase can be rugged, if not downright dangerous. The whales have scattered now in their mad dash for the safety of the river, where the whalers may not follow. This is very unlike the normal whaling industry with high-powered guns and factory ships. Some of the belugas are not harpooned by the whalers, are actually captured alive. The snow white whale is in demand by aquariums from all over the world. But in this case, I'm really pleased though because these pictures belong to history. How do you mean, Gil? Well, the practice of harvesting beluga whales was begun as an industry to help poverty-stricken natives. At the time, I suppose, it was a, a good idea, but kind of hard on belugas. Because of public pressure, the whale products from the factory, like uh, mink and fox food, stayed on store shelves. A missile launch site was built near Churchill, and that bolstered the economy a little bit. It's kind of funny to think the beluga might have been saved by rockets. Do the people eat whales anymore? Oh yeah, they love the muck tuck. That's the layer found just on top of the skin. It's not difficult to see why there was such a hue and cry to stop slaughtering such beautiful animals. And also I think pictures like these help bring the situation to the attention of a concerned government as well as a very conservation-minded Canadian people. It isn't outlawed, but very few whales are being killed. More profitable to catch them alive. So, while once a migration to the Churchill River breeding ground might have meant a trip to the canning factory, today it's a peaceful haven. The frenzied roar of whaling outboards lives only in the memories of the whalers themselves.
few months later, I dropped in to talk to an old friend of mine, Rusty Myers. He's a charter plane operator out of Fort Francis, Manitoba. And we talked about odd fishing and the group that was just headed out. When he told me about the technique they used, I got our crew together and we tagged along to watch some skittering. Fort Francis, we flew way into the Canadian wilderness to a remote lake. That's where Rusty had one of his camps. Of course, as it was explained to me, skittering works in any lake or ocean with almost any kind of predatory game fish of any size. While some of the skitterers rested or photographed air views of the lake dotted wilderness, I got filled in on just exactly how the technique works. Seems like the key ingredient is a 20 foot long fiberglass pole but the way you use it isn't what you'd expect. And they were sure in a hurry. As we taxied in, they got their gear all ready. See, we wanted to film setting up the telescoping poles. Unfortunately, Don's first try ends in near disaster. Ole! <laughs> there she goes. Usually flipping that pole out is a real crowd pleaser. Wouldn't you know, as soon as I had the camera running, the pole came apart. Darn near sank out of sight, too. Second try worked a little better. You know, it'd be almost impossible to transport these poles if they didn't telescope. Taping the joints has a double purpose. First, it keeps the poles from coming apart under a strong pull. And second, it makes all the joints waterproof. You'll see the reason for that a little bit later. Good stout leaders used with a strong line to make the terminal tackle slightly longer than the pole. And the bait? Well, that's another story. You'd figure coming this far with a pole that big, the lures have to be unusual. And they are. Spoons, just as big as you can get them. The bigger, the better. A little spit for luck, over they go. Boat speed is critical. Too slow and those chunks of steel will sink like stones. Too fast and they won't flutter. They'll plane like surfboards. The just right speed is pretty fast though. The idea is to keep those flashing billboards working but not spinning, just under the surface. Naturally, that'll put a man-sized bend in the rod. Celery-type weeds are important to an expert skitterer, but not if they're on the hook. So Raj and Dan check the lures pretty often. Roger draws first blood. You can see from the bend in the rod, it isn't a very big one. Some lunker northern will tear that pole right out of your hands. And that's why the poles have to be watertight, so they'll float behind the fish and you can retrieve them. Knowing where to fish is vital to skittering. Northern like to hang out along weedy drop-offs where they can snag smaller fish that use these celery weeds for protection. By trolling along the edge of the shells, Skitters take advantage of the northern's hit-and-run tactics. You know, if it weren't for these predatory fish, the wilderness lakes would be overrun with small fish, suckers, panfish, and the like. The big northern keep populations down. A sea clamp makes a handy brace for the pole. But when a northern hits one of those big lures, swing the pole free of the clamp, or a broken pole could result. And by the way, skitterers swear by the action of these skillet-sized daredevils. There's an adage among pike fishermen, if there's one, there's more. Trouble is, you can't always tell what size. For these guys, a pike doesn't even begin to get interesting until it gets over 20 pounds or so. So this little fella can go back to the weed beds and grow up. Knowing underwater terrain comes from being able to interpret the shore. For instance, skitterers learn to watch for clay banks on shore. The clay that washes into the lake makes ideal conditions for the celery-type weed that signals hot northern country. Don and Roger have worked this patch enough times to stir the big pike into a frenzy. Rough water helps, too. The big ones won't spook. They just get madder and madder. 
Here's another point that most pike fishermen know. Those sharp teeth can tear a hand up pretty good, so keep your fingers out of that mouth. A firm hold on the eye sockets paralyzes the fish. I can sure understand that. By the way, if you plan on releasing the fish, use a net. Never release a fish that's been held this way. Usually fish this size have a favorite hangout. When they're gone, another lunker is quick to take the spot. On the second pass, at Granddaddy Northern that's been stirred up by all the ruckus flashes in and the fight's on. Now keep your eyes on Don. He keeps that pole up high away from his body. That's so the fish can't get any leverage and break off the tip. Some big fish like this have dived right to the bottom, taking the tackle and pole and all. In a few cases, the huge pole's never been seen again. Now, this is no place for a hand landing. Matter of fact, in the old days, a battle like this was often ended right here with a shot from a 44 pistol. Now, to be sure of the prize, an outsized net isn't bad insurance. Of course, you gotta be able to get him into it. <laughs> Now, don't let this sound like sour grapes, but this northern weighed in at only 22 pounds. That's hardly in the big fish size. Still, Don and Raj had plenty to be happy with. Turned out it was the biggest one caught on the trip. Usually, though, they'd expect to catch 30, 35 pounders. Must have been the dark of the moon. Seems, too, they've tried this skittering out down south on big bass, and again in Florida on barracuda. Results? Don said there's something else. So the next time you guys are looking for a stringer that'll pop their eyes out at the local bait shop, remember skittering. Sneak out to your favorite spot and give it a try. You know, when you come right down to it, big fish are a pretty good reason to hit these remote northern lakes. But just being there, is really what counts. Well, Jack, that's about all. I do have some great stuff on Eskimos, but I guess that really belongs in a hunting film. Well, boy, that was some real unusual stuff, Gil. That uh, beluga bit especially. It's a bit of history, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, uh-huh. It's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> well, fellas, I uh, guess it's my turn. And, uh... I don't want to brag or beat a point to death, but when it comes to unusual fishing, it's hard to beat our American South. Now, you fellas had some pretty good fish stories, I admit that. But most of our people were born to fish. Catching them is more a way of life than a sport. One of the most unusual techniques you'll find in the South, or anywhere else, takes place only in Mississippi, just north of Jackson and what we call the Great Lakes. We were up there filming bass fishing for a PR outfit. You know, this is where the trophy largemouths come from. Well, the filming was going pretty good. Our actors were tying into some nice fish. Nothing in a 10-pound class, you understand, but big enough to give some darn good fish splashes. Now, you fellas know how hard those are to get. Yeah, isn't that the truth? Yeah, like some of my frozen fish in the winter sequence. Yeah, right. Anyway, everything went pretty good that day. Then our actors, who were really expert fishermen, told us about a group of guys that don't use anything but their bare hands for fishing. You know, these look like pretty good fish, but can you imagine catching 50, 60 pound catfish with nothing more than pinky power? Well, I hustled a crew right over there, promised not to tell exactly where, to watch these men do a seldom seen technique called grabbling. Right about now or any time from May to July, big old catfish are looking for a place to spawn. All these fellas do is oblige them. Now pay close attention, because this is kind of hard to understand. Years ago, they dragged hollow logs out here and sank them a foot or so underwater. The logs are plugged on the backside. Spawning catfish like a protective place to lay their eggs, so these logs are popular. The idea of grabbling is to trap the catfish inside the log before it can escape. This is old Herschel Howell checking a log they call Fifth the Whiskey Log. Anyway, the idea is to sneak up on a log without scaring the daylights out of anything inside. 
Then he sticks his whole body into the open end of the log like a cork in a bottle. With the front door blocked, he can probe around with a cane wrapped with belly wire. Naturally, if he pokes an old flathead catfish, he's going to kick up quite a fuss and try to escape. The only way out is over, around, or through old Herschel. Really big fish has been known to take a hold of a grabbler and drag him out into deep water. Not old Herschel, though. He's the best grabbler in the state. Told me that himself. Nothing here. You've heard of a trap line on land. Well, these logs are kind of a fish line, whereby they use a boat to go from log to log. The men wear wet suits to keep them warm and coveralls for protection against snags. Once Herschel has gotten into the log, he plants his feet hard on the bottom part. Otherwise, a catfish could push under him and get away. Right here, the fish is pushing against Herschel's chest. Meanwhile, Herschel shoves a rope through the catfish's mouth and out the gills. Then he hands the two ends to the man in the boat. Now, if all this seems a little confusing, join the crowd. Anyway, I guess you could say they put the fish on a stringer without bothering to catch him first. Two-fish log has always been a good producer. You know, one of the dangers of grappling isn't a 90-pound catfish, nor is it the occasional cottonmouth. Instead, it's the smaller fish. They tend to spin when the grappler sticks his hand in the fish's mouth, rips the hand good. These are catfish eggs. Catching a cat during spawn isn't any worse than catching one two weeks before the spawn begins. The result is the same. Besides, this is hardly a way to take a limit of fish. With smaller cats like this, Herschel does away with the rope. A simple grab with a hand does the trick here. This is a black cat. Not prime eating fish, but prepared by an expert a treat for any table. These men switch to the log form of grabbling from bank grabbling because of snakes and the occasional alligator snapper that hides under river banks. Here you can see the operation again. Herschel's in the log and pushing the rope right through the catfish's mouth and out its gills. Mm, that's a mad fish. I suppose the whole thing began with people who just couldn't afford tackle. They never know when the next log will have a 90 pounder. And then it's a real toss-up to who'll win. No question about it, when it comes to a real tall tail, the Mississippi Graveler's got to be in contention for first prize. Only last year, our crew was working in Alabama. I'd heard a lot of talk about fishing in the Mobile area. So later, we drove down to check. On the way, I thought about some of the stories I'd heard. It sounded as if they'd forgotten what a hook and line were for. Take in Fairhope, for instance. The town fathers built a beautiful fishing pier. After a wandering hurricane pulled a little unexpected urban renewal. But with all that modern concrete, lots of folks are turning back the clock to fish with the ancient and beautiful cast net. Casting's a real art. And some say it works better on jangled nerves and a bottle of tranquilizers. Must, too. There's enough people doing it. When thrown, the net acts like a parachute, except the shroud lines, instead of hanging down, go up through a hole in the top. As the net sinks, the lines are pulled up, closing the bottom. Mullet are the usual catch. But big shrimp and flounder are a bonus you can expect from time to time. Even rod and reelers have their oddities when it comes to catching bait. This little bait rig is made of nothing more than some twisted together wire and a bit of red yarn. Works like a single strand gill net. Bait fish are attracted to red. So the rig is lowered into the water for about a minute. Little fish move in for what they think is a feast. When they find the yarn isn't any good to eat, they swim ahead and right into the wire loops. Even in 60 seconds, like magic, the wire loops snare a few every time. 
Not enough fish to wipe out the school, but enough to keep any self-respecting rod and reel fisherman in bait all day long. Hey, Harold, you should try this out on those smelt of yours in Lake Superior. No, too slow for smelt. Yeah, I guess. Catfish probably account for more funky fishing ideas than any other. Upriver from Mobile, we ran into these jug fishermen. With so many fish and chip places going up, catching catfish has become a profitable business. In this heat, juggers are looking to catch a limit with a minimum amount of work. They just hook a baited line to an old bleach jug. With enough jugs in, you can just drift down a river and let the fish do the work. Most of fish are average size, but these juggers tell of a day when five jugs in a row went under and were never seen again. That tops your fiberglass pole story, Gil. When the action starts, you got to keep an eye peeled, because the cats will drag your jug into the trees in no time flat. Like I said, it was pretty hot. About 100 degrees with humidity thick enough to drink. So once the jug's in hand, this youngster feels the time to hurry is long past. But you know, the demand for these fish is so great, they're being raised in hatcheries, like chickens. Whoops, the cats have found a bait now. By the way, before y'all try this, you better check local fish laws. A bunch of states don't allow more than one line for fishermen. The boy's father figured if he could just get his youngster out of low gear, he could double his catch in half the time. Still, what he lacks in speed, he makes up by hanging in there. And it's awful hard to argue with a stringer like this. Anyone who's ever fished in the South knows about trashy old garfish. They're good for nothing and they're everywhere. Well, a bit of combed out nylon rope can help you sharpen fishing skills without scarring up lures or losing bait. The rope acts just like a jig. Gar thinks it's a small fish and the action's on. See, in the Gar's book of tricks, it says once you got a fish in your bill, hold on like a cat in a bathtub. Of course, by the time the Gar's figured out something wrong, it's too late. Once you've got that rope in there, getting it out can be something of a chore. See, the guy's got rows of sharp teeth. That's how they can hold small fish so well. Well, the nylon gets all twisted around the teeth most of the time. So you gotta resort to pliers to get the job done. Anyway, like I said, you can have a ball with nothing more than a chunk of rope. All you need's the guy's natural instinct to hold on. No hooks needed. Most people think of Mobile Bay as a seaport or a Civil War battle site, but it's got some unusual fishing too. In the swamps, there's plenty of wildlife, like the giant gator. There's still some poaching going on, but you're seeing more and more baby alligators. Down here, things are getting pretty integrated. They've mixed a big old alligator with a garfish, and they came up with something pretty special. Now, some don't agree this should be labeled sporting, but these alligator gar fishermen sure do. I suppose you'd call them purists, since a 100-pound gar has no value except for the sport of catching it. Down here, we call them the poor man's marlin. Of course, I was kidding about the gator gar cross. Really, the alligator gar is a prehistoric fish. We know it comes to us directly from the age when giant reptiles roam the Triassic swamplands. There's some doubt about whether the fish is beneficial or not, so most are returned to the water alive. Tackle consists of heavy wire leaders, which are made up as needed, and mullet for bait. 
Because of this, many believe alligator gar are important scavengers. Some gar fishermen also maintain the mullet head is the very best bait. <laughs> These fellas are fishing in the brackish water of Mobile Bay. The gar are perfectly willing to go sailing in or out of fresh water if the mood strikes them. Lines are cast out on the ebb of a flood tide. Then it's just a matter of time till a gar coming back from the outer bay finds it. Now watch this. Has one fish got both baits? Gar-like, the fish will swim a ways with the bait in its jaws. You've got to wait till he stops and begins to swallow. Oh, he's taking it off. Oh, let me at it. His bone's gone. When he moves again, sock it to him. Look at him now, let's see it. Four playing wounded. Oh, let me at it go. It isn't one fish, it's two. Sam's fish is near the boat. Nothing for it. Sam's got to try to gaff his own one-handed. Look at it go! Only one spot the gaff will hold under the chin. Doesn't hurt the fish either. With Sam's gar on board, it's time to concentrate on Larry's. There's no question about where the alligator gar got its name or its nasty reputation for being able to take a boat apart from inside. The gar's prehistoric ancestry is evident in its tail. Only in ancient fishes does the spinal cord extend into the tail's upper lobe. Its body is protected with armor-like scales, next to human tooth enamel and hardness. Adequate protection against everything but man. And even man has taken a wait-and-see attitude about too quickly condemning still another seemingly ungraceful form of nature's handiwork, the alligator gar. Now this next story I found over in South Carolina, just outside Columbia, on the placid Congaree River. Oh, it's a beautiful state. People there seem to have kind of remembered what gracious living's all about. But when it comes to fishing, well, that's something else. This fella in the boat here is Billy Mahaffey. Now, you're not going to believe what I'm about to say, but I swear every word of it is true. First of all, down here in the Santee Cupper impoundment, they've managed to get striped bass changed from a saltwater fish to a freshwater one, same as the garfish. Only people are happier about it. The transplanting has become a real success, and fish in the 20, 30, and even 40-pound class aren't too uncommon. And it does draw people, like for the annual striped bass tournament. Now you can understand how with all these nut fishermen around, some weird techniques be bound to show up. Well, it has in the form of Mr. Billy Mahaffey, whom we found early one morning on a river feeding the Santee Cupper. Now watching Billy in action most of the time, you'd think he's pretty much the normal fisherman most of the time. But Billy is very successful, more so than other fishermen. Why? Because of his special technique for gathering striped bass or rockfish, as they're called here, in large numbers around his boat. Fish biologists say Billy's technique just won't work. Other fishermen say it won't either. But it does. 
Come on. Whoop. Come on, fish. Yep. Hard as it may seem to believe, Billy Mahaffey calls fish. Trouble is, once called, there's no guarantee as to how big they'll be. Is Billy embarrassed? Oh, I'll say, and in front of a city feller, too. But the fact is, fisheries biologists from three states have fished with Billy and all agree that while it can't work, there's no use arguing with success. And just so you won't think there's anything talking but the camera, I got to tell you, Billy doesn't drink a drop. Well, nothing stronger than cola. Now watch the artistry as Billy talks him into the boat. Come on, little fish. Call these things up here and get some fish on these lines. Good gracious, we haven't seen here in 10 minutes. They haven't had a bite. Come on, little fish. Come on, talk to your daddy. What ails you today, anyhow? Come on. Now watch them rods right close, because now we're going to flat get some bites right now in a minute. Billy's young friends all caught up in the excitement. Okay, down to some serious fishing. After these scenes were made, we ran a test on Billy. We found a shallow, clear eddy where we could see, and we asked Billy to call in some fish. He made three calls in a space of five minutes, at which time we counted 17 small fish milling around in the pool. I guess when the evidence is all in, I gotta go along with the experts. It just can't work. I mean, how would sound get down in the water? And if it did, why would the fish pay any attention anyway? Even Billy is quick to admit he doesn't have the slightest idea why his technique works. But to Billy Mahaffey, the facts are clear. When he calls fish, he catches fish. Many times after he's been completely skunked. Come on, fish. Ah! Ah! Ooh! Trouble is, Billy taught one of the biologists, who wasn't much of a fisherman, how to call, and when he got back to his home state, he became known as the hottest fisherman going. All right, son, you've got him now. Hold him while you got him. Hold him while you got him. While you got him. Bring him on. It's a nice one. So there you have it. Is the technique real? Or is it just a great fisherman at work? It's hard to say. I've heard arguments go on far into the night long after Billy's retired. And they aren't drinking cola anymore. Maybe it was the bad weather that kept Billy from catching any really big fish that day. But he had a logical conclusion for it. All them big fish, Billy said, as they got ready to leave, were just too far downriver and out of earshot. Later, we heard of another kind of fishing no one seemed to know much about, tree fishing. trying to find out ourselves, we got a lot of bum steers. Because this certainly isn't tree fishing. And we found out a little while later that while this scene is all too common, it isn't tree fishing either. This has got to be tree fishing. But it isn't. Nope, tree fishing is different from all that. In these flooded forests, minnows have learned to hide in submerged roots. Crappies, being natural predators, hang around the trees and pick off fry that stray too far from their protection. Naturally, with all that food, you can be pretty sure of good-sized fish if you use purest tree fishing techniques. Special tree fishing cane poles are a must. 
Now, they may look like other cane poles, but they aren't. Notice the boat also. It's designed specially for maneuvering around trees. But when it comes to pure forms of fishing, few can compete with one found in the salt marshes near resorts of Hilton Head and Fripp Island. This is called chunking. Now, the idea is to chunk along in a traditional manner until your fork pierces something, hopefully not your foot. Then presto, fresh flounder. Now, this may look easy, but make no mistake, there's a true art form at work here. It takes years of practice. The sun chunks pretty good, but lacks the finesse of a polished chunker. He needs the follow through and backswing of the true professional, possibly because he's chunked his share of stingrays. Anyway, there isn't much chance of wiping out the flounder population using the time-honored chunking as your technique. We ran into another time-honored weapon within earshot of the marine training base at Paris Island. Every spring, a sporting game fish, the cobia, makes a spawning run into the rivers that feed Port Royal Sound. By using a good boat, a bow and arrow, and lots of time, some lucky archers even take a few fish. The cobia is known by a lot of names. Ling, coalfish, black bonito, lemonfish, sergeant fish, and black salmon. It looks easy, but believe me, we waited a long time to photograph this. While we're filming this first catch, we noticed another boat not too far away that was having a bundle of trouble. Whatever they have on has pulled that boat all over Port Royal Sound. They say they had a shark on for three hours. Going to get a picture and cut it loose. We offered our help, and they accepted. Buzz is using a 54-pound herder's bow. It drives the harpoon in deep. And with the extra pull of a 100-pound bowline, the shark pops to the surface like an old champagne cork. All of a sudden, the shark gives a flip of its powerful tail and dives. Buzz grabs with a bow. The line snags. Pop! 100-pound line snap like twine. Enough of this fooling around. Maybe a broadhead will finish him off. Didn't finish him, but sure made him mad. Still, time and arrows have taken their toll. So sink home the gaff and let's get on with cobia fishing. Of course, you've got to be able to stand up to do it. During all this poor gaffing, the arrow breaks off and Buzz goes to grab it. How'd you like to stick your hand in the water with a mad shark in it? Now, this here is what I call skillful technique. Lift the shark with an oar and tie a noose around its tail. Well, even if those fishermen aren't too much for gaffing, you can bet they're pleased as punch with the catch. This one will go into Beaufort to compete in a local contest. So good luck, fellas, and let's get back to bow fishing. We'd like a cobia near the record of 102 pounds. So we decided to try a shallow area near the marine base where cobia are seen in great numbers. There, there's one. Quiet now. Head the boat in that direction. Kill the motor. Drift. Two of them. One a real whopper. But then at the last second, the fish see us and dodge. The big fella's still there. Easy, careful, hold on a second, shoot! Man, dead center! He'd better keep that line tight. Buzz is using a poor harpoon head for fish this big. They screw onto the shaft instead of swiveling. Every right-hand spin Miss Bruza makes helps unscrew the harpoon head, and it only takes eight turns to come off. 
When we get the Kobe on board, there's only a half turn left before the shaft pulls loose. 55 pounds of fighting fish. The cobia is delicious as is, but smoked, it's a gourmet's delight. South Carolina is famous for its beaches. Naturally, if you got beaches, something else goes with them like ham and eggs. And the beginning of that something starts right here in a muddy tidal creek. Now, what do you think would be attractive enough to lure a group of good-looking young people into a gooky, oozy place like this? What a place to bring a girl on a date. These Southern boys really know what it takes to turn them on. Actually, the creek is full of clams. They're buried in the mud by the thousands. It just takes sensitive feet and strong hands to find them. Ordinarily, big round clams are fit only for chowder. But in South Carolina, they're tender enough to take to the party just as they come from the water. And this is what goes with beaches, parties. The kids have some music going and a hot fire when the clams arrive. The tub goes on to steam and the kids, well, they do what kids do best. Some people don't take too kindly to fresh clams. But when you come from the shore, you just naturally know what's good. From South Carolina, I head my crew south to West Palm Beach, Florida. And the real reason for my trip, a giant shark derby. West Palm Beach is popular for its beautiful beaches and well laid out golf courses. Trouble is some of these links have unexpected natural hazards that move around. Florida's blight, the walking catfish, started out live as a bitty little fish for home aquariums. Somehow the little fish just hopped out of their bowls and walked off. Naturally, they headed for the nearest water, just like this one. They bred and multiplied, and now they're everywhere. Some people call them running catfish. As Soon as you clean them out of a pond, they just run over to one nearby and try to fill the first one up again. Say meow. <coughs> they can stay out of water for a long period. The usual color is black, like this one. I know a fella who caught one of these and threw it in the trunk of his car. Well, he went off and forgot it was there. 24 hours later, he opened his trunk and found it all shriveled up like a prune. But he put it in water, and it lived. Anyway, in a West Palm Beach suburb every year, they hold the annual shark tournament. Everything that'll float carries people out to kill sharks. You see all kinds of unorthodox techniques to take shark like Herb Goodman pounding weights into a bait fish. Herb fishes from shore, but puts the bait out in a number of odd ways and makes sure there are plenty of hooks in the fish before it goes to work. I went out on a friend's boat and ran into a strange set of fishing companions. When I came on board, Bill here looked like he'd run into the granddaddy of all sharks. But as it turned out, it was a couple of their fishing buddies going after the grand prize their own way. The two and the Perry shark hunter had spotted Bill's baited hook, and for fun, it was only natural to let him catch a fiberglass shark. Well, so much for games. Back to work. Those two nuts, they'll try anything. Meanwhile, back on shore, sharks were beginning to pour into the weigh station. Ordinarily, there aren't too many shark in these waters. 
but for a few weeks in spring, sharks, like this weird and exotic hammerhead, pour into an inter-island channel offshore to breed. So Floridians, not being shy about turning a disadvantage into a bonanza, mix pretty girls with sharks and come up with a tall tale all their own. While a carnival air prevails on shore, out in the channel, skin divers hunt the most deadly game. Not one of these vicious brutes weighs less than 500 pounds. Even giant 400-pound sea bass pose a real threat to divers. These fish will attack anything that approaches their spawned eggs. But the divers are after bigger game than even the giant bass. Today, armed with deadly bang sticks, spears loaded with 12-gauge shotgun shells, the divers stalk the true killers of the sea like this dangerous and unpredictable Mako shark. Only a well-placed shot will do the job. A miss, and the Mako will tear him to bits. Long about now, my mouth's as dry as dirt. I'm hoping that Mako's girlfriend doesn't take a sudden objection to photographers. stick, he's as helpless as a poodle in a pond of piranhas. So you can't blame the diver for wanting to reload. A shark has no brain to speak of, so only a shot severing the spinal cord can kill a shark this dead, this quick. In this game, position is everything. The diver, like a fighter plane, has to strike from above the shark. The diver checks that exploding head one last time. If it misfires, the shark will turn on him. As I watched, I feel shivers run up my spine. It's all I can do to stay at my camera's viewfinder. I keep wanting to check the water behind me. The mouthful of hooked teeth are peculiar to this fearsome but valuable game fish. Now, don't quote me, but many times around these parts, when you think you're eating swordfish, it's really mako shark. Meanwhile, not far away, our friends in the sub are having troubles of their own. It turns out normal-sized sharks have a natural aversion to yellow submarines. They must feel anything that big and that color that hums and bubbles can't be up to any good. So the pickings seem pretty slim. Suddenly, a dark shadow crosses the sub. A monster tiger shark. Yellow subs don't scare it. Relentlessly, the little submarine pursues. They want to make the tiger angry. They've got to make it turn or at least slow down long enough for the deadly bang stick harpoon to do its job. The next few moments will tell the story. If the shark runs, they've lost the battle. If it turns, and it does. Angry, annoyed, who knows? But the tiger makes a pass at the divers. No chance to shoot. The beast moves behind them and comes in again. This time, they're ready for it. At the very last second, the huge predator presents its side to the divers and... Now, quickly, the shark is badly wounded, but it could still recover and swim off. A second shot is needed to finish the killer off. The monster is dead. The divers begin to get an idea of how big their shark really is. With full power on, the little sub hardly moves. After a long haul, and with batteries running low, they pull alongside. This is a nervous moment. They're excited about the catch, but their minds are constantly on what may have been attracted by the blood. 
Finally, the huge beast is hooked up. Winches aboard the larger boat groan, almost stop. Estimates on size run wild. Later, we learn the monster weighs 1,430 pounds. A mouth this size can easily snap a man in two. There's even an authenticated story about one this size that when caught in a net, grabbed a 25-gallon steel float and flattened it with one bite. And that's my tallest fish tail. Only in this case, it's true. What's more, I've got the pictures to prove it. So there you have it. Wherever there are creatures that swim under the water, and wherever there are men and women to hunt them, there will always be those that simply don't want to follow the trend. People who find their own way, do their own thing. People who are labeled different by conformists who will never understand. These have been the explorers of the fishing world, the experimenters, the seekers, the doers. The potential for adventure lies deep in the heart of everyone. These unusual techniques are everywhere, in the remote places of the world and right in your own backyard. All it takes is the curiosity to look for those strange but true tall fishing tales.